This is going to be James chapter 1, 18 through 27. And we are going to see the power of the word of truth. And the word of truth brings the new birth. James 1, 18 says, Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Beget is referring to the new birth. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1.23, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So we are born again by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1.25 says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. If you come to Jesus Christ and believe on him and his precious blood to save you, then you will be born again. James 1.18 has a double application because it also applies to the twelve tribes. Notice it says, Beget he us. And that personal pronoun shows it is talking to a group of people instead of just an individual. And then the last half of the verse says that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And the first fruits here is referring to the Old Testament saints that arose with Jesus Christ. And you read about that in 1 Corinthians 15.20. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And then you read about it in Matthew 27, 52. It says, And the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So this was the first fruits, but you have a harvest coming later. And the harvest is the 144,000 Jews and the 12 tribes who are called first fruits in Revelation 14.4, right before the harvest in Revelation 14.15. And we will go ahead and get verse 21 of James chapter 1, because it goes right along with this. And we're going to see the word of truth is able to save your souls. James 1.21 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Notice it said which is able to save your souls, showing this isn't talking to a Christian, because if it was it would say which did save your souls. This is talking to someone who isn't saved, and superfluity means like superabundance. It is when you have something in a greater quantity than you want. And naughtiness isn't referring to like a little kid being naughty. It is a lot worse than that. Look at Proverbs 11.6. It says, The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. So this that isn't like a little kid being naughty. It's associated with a transgressor. In Proverbs 11.6. And notice the verse in James also said, Receive with meekness the engrafted word. If someone is meek, they are humble and not full of pride. They are gentle but not weak. Not gentle in a sissy way, but meek in the way Jesus Christ was meek. Someone who is meek would be in submission to God's will. And Zephaniah 2.3 says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So receive the word of truth with meekness. We are also going to see the word of truth brings confidence. So go back up to verse 19 in James chapter 1. It says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, Notice the wherefore that follows verse 18. So since we have the new birth, we should be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. If you labor in studying the word of truth and get all of your doctrine straight, then the word of truth brings a boldness and confidence. Not because of your own personal knowledge, because you are some smart person or something, but because you have the word of truth hid in your heart. 
and you have confidence in the word of truth. When you are talking to someone about doctrine who disagrees with you on that particular topic, you would be swift to hear. You would be swift to hear listening to what they are saying and not planning your rebuttal. You don't have to plan your rebuttal because you have the word of truth in your heart. You would be slow to speak. You would give them time to finish what they are saying before you jump in. And also Proverbs 10.19 says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore let not therefore let thy words be few. And you are also to be slow to wrath, because when you know you have the truth, you got the word of truth hidden in your heart, it shouldn't bother you when someone disagrees. That shouldn't make you mad. And most of the time the person who gets mad is the person who's wrong. Proverbs sixteen 32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. And then James 1.20 says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ was slow to anger, but still got mad at times. But it was never without a cause, and the Bible does say, Be ye angry and sin not. So you can get angry and it not be a sin. And Matthew 5.22 says, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Did you know that in a lot of the new versions of the Bible, they take out the words without a cause, therefore making Jesus Christ a sinner because he got angry with his brothers at times? This just goes to show every word of the word of truth is important. You don't want to take away the power of the word of truth. People do this in the new versions of the Bible. They corrupt the word of God. And you can't take out even just one, two, or three words and it not corrupt something. It will always mess up major Bible doctrine just by taking out a word here and there. But you get confidence through the word of truth. Not only that, but the word of truth is like a mirror. James 1, 22 through 23 says, But be ye do doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. The word of truth is like a mirror, because it shows who you really are. It not only shows the outside, but shows the inside. So when you get mad at the Bible, it is like an ugly woman getting mad at the mirror because it shows the flaws on her face. You see the reflection of Jesus Christ when you read the Bible. And you should want to become more like Him because you see you don't line up with Jesus Christ. You won't line up with Jesus Christ unless you apply the word of truth in all areas of your life. In some ways, a mirror is a type of the Bible, is a mirror is no good if you don't use it. Just like if you can have 15 Bibles laying around, but what good are they to you if you're not even going to use them? A broken mirror gives you a false image. All of these new Bibles are broken, and they give you a false image of the Word of God. A mirror will not lie, just like the Bible can't lie. God cannot lie. You can't blame a mirror for what you see. It's not the Bible's fault you're a sinner. It's just telling you you are one. Uh, you see your true condition in a mirror, not someone else's. It's best to use a mirror at the beginning of the day. Just like it's best to get up and read the Bible every morning before you go out into the world. Uh, running from a mirror won't do any good and it won't change your looks. A mirror grows with you. A mirror reflects light, just like the Bible reflects light. So a man who reads the Bible and hears the words of God preached, but yet doesn't change his wicked ways, is like a man who sees himself in a mirror, but doesn't fix his hair 
wash his face, brush his teeth, and wipe the snot from his nose. He just goes on like it doesn't matter and like he didn't even see it. And James one twenty four says, For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. When a man stays in the Bible, it is like a spiritual mirror that will show him what parts of the inside need cleaning. It helps him to see, to get the beam out of his eye. He can see to get the filthy communication coming out of his mouth. It shows him he needs to get rid of the cussing and the dirty jokes. He can get rid of the wicked music he sees in his ears. And he can get his nose out of the world, which that Paul calls this present evil world. Uh, James one twenty five says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Paul talks about us having liberty. Galatians 5 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Romans six fourteen says, For sin shall have not shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace. We have liberty in Christ, and we are no longer under law but under grace in the church age. This is different than what James is talking about in chapter 1. Notice James says, Looking into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. Paul doesn't say anything about continuing. And the holiness crowd, church of God, Catholics, and whosoever else is teaching a works-based salvation in the church age, love verses that say continue like Acts 13.43, because it implies if they don't continue, then they are damned, even if they had been saved. The problem is, they aren't rightly dividing. James is talking doctrinally to the twelve tribes of Israel in the tribulation, when they stay looking in the mirror, and being a doer of the word, and not just a hearer of the word. The continuing to look, is the deed which God blesses in James one twenty five. In the tribulation it is a faith plus work system. So they have to be a doer of the work. So James one twenty five, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And you can apply this spiritually to the church age and that we are rewarded for working for Jesus Christ when we get to the judgment seat of Christ. And now James one twenty six says, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. James mentions a lot about religion. And when religion is mentioned in the Bible, it is talking about Judaism. Galatians 1.13 says, For if ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. The definition of religion is pretty much works. Christianity is not a religion, but a relationship with Jesus Christ. Christianity isn't about works. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you can see James referring a lot to works and religion, and that's because it is a faith plus works set up in the tribulation. As we said before, Revelation fourteen twelve. here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And many will say, well, someone who has the faith of Jesus will keep the commandments of God. But another difference is, they aren't just keeping the commandments of God. It also says they are to keep the faith of Jesus. Look at the verse. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In the church age, we don't have to keep the faith to be saved. 
or to stay saved. Because Second Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he can't deny himself. And James 1.26 says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, if you bridle something, you restrain it. You need to bridle your tongue. Psalms 34.13 says, Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. The tongue and the heart are connected. And Matthew twenty four, I mean Matthew twelve thirty four says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. If a man puts the words of truth in his heart, then his tongue will speak it. Uh, James one twenty seven says pure religion. And undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Pure religion will take a person to hell in this dispensation. Pure religion is works, and we aren't saved by works. We aren't saved by getting baptized and living right. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. A man in the tribulation time period is going to have to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And keep himself unspotted from the world. He does this by not taking the mark of the beast. And before you turn me off, look at these verses. You can't say that I'm teaching false doctrine here and be closed minded. And just shut me off because of what I'm saying here. And you're not going to learn anything if you just shut everyone off that disagrees with you. Revelation 16.2 says... And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. And upon them which worshipped his image. You know what animal has spots? A leopard. And Revelation 13.2 says the Antichrist is like unto a leopard. He is the opposite of the lamb. 1 Peter 1.18 says, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And the lamb's wife is without blemish and without spot. Remember, a noisome and grievous sore comes upon the men who take the mark of the beast. And leprosy can get into your clothes. And that is why Jude 23 says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So a tribulation saint is going to have to keep himself unspotted from the world. And he does this by not taking the Antichrist, who is likened to a leopard. They're not, they can't take his mark. And they are going to have to escape the pollutions of the world. Second Peter 2.20 says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So the keeping themselves unspotted from the world and escaping the pollutions of the world has to do with staying on God's side and not giving in to the Antichrist and taking the mark of the beast. And so this has been James 1, 18 through 18-27. We will stop here and start up again on James chapter 2.